Hey everybody and welcome back to Dude's Brunch, late night morning talk show where four people talk about four things they found on the internet. I'm your host, Taylor Olmstead, and with me as always to discuss his diet and his browsing history, it's Tyler Reed. Tyler, you're coming to us from a new location, your own bachelor pad. Tell us, did you cook yourself breakfast this morning in your new place? Fuck no. Of course not. <laughs> The only thing I've eaten inside this house has currently been uh, part of a Crave case and some peanut butter pie. So <laughs> so basically, <laughs> you have reverted back to high school, Tyler. Uh, in some ways. It, not intentionally. Definitely an accident. Well, I don't think accident's the right word. It was more like I had to work and also move. So I didn't really have a whole lot of time for a whole lot else, which means going to the grocery store. For some reason, that totem pole was like, grocery stores, wait, I don't, wait, lower on the totem pole. There you go. It's at the very bottom. It's the bottom most part of the yes, totem pole. Basic sustenance, lowest possible priority. <laughs> um, so on to the topic at hand. What did I have for brunch? I think following up from last week... I had a blueberry pastry and some black iced coffee, so I'm killing it again. Not bad. It is technically a breakfast food. Mm -hmm. But not a brunch food. That's fair. Sean Evans is here. Sean, what did you have for brunch today? I made pancakes this morning. Pancakes and coffee. Just He's doing it again. The simple route, you know? The most beautiful pancake that I willed into existence ever. It was like the most beautiful blonde. Oh my god, I made it and I like called Sarah out of bed. I was like, come look at this. Come look at this. This is so beautiful. So I'll post that in the show notes so everybody can see it because it is like... It's the most gorgeous uh, pancake I've ever seen, Sean. I mean, I hop. You should probably go, you know, I don't know. You should yeah, just you shut the doors. Turn into the International House of Crepes. Basically, yeah, because you, you don't got nothing on my pancake game. So, uh, so yeah. Legit. Well, as I said, I'm your host, Taylor, and for brunch this morning, I pulled a Sean and just w took the simple route. I had some scrambled eggs and salsa and some black coffee, and it oh, was that delicious. Sound good. Yeah, you know, I found um, this salsa that I really like. Uh, it's called Frog Ranch Salsa. It's made in Gloucester, Ohio, but you can buy it in Kroger's all over the country. It's got this like nice black pepper kick to it. It's really good in eggs. Mmm. Can we talk about another food side item real quick? Of course. Okay. So Sarah and I were talking, and I decided that property values should be decided by two things. Locations and proximities to Chick-fil-A and Trader Joe's. Well, then in that case, the whole northern half of Atlanta would be really expensive. Oh, wait, it already is. See? That's what I mean. Mine would be a local coffee shop in which I discovered that I have one very close to me. Probably within biking distance. How far is that? Well, unfortunately, the problem about where I decided to move was the apartment complex is called Hilltop Apartments. <laughs> and they weren't lying. It's on a hill. It's on a hill. It's almost like... <laughs> so... <laughs> it's going to be real good going down. Going back up is going to be the problem. But luckily, there's sidewalk all the way, so... This week I'm on sorry. Dude's Brunch, Tyler learns how to read. <laughs> <laughs> Contextualizing titles. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. You had an actual question. What did you say? I'm sorry. Do you, no, it was, more, it was more of a statement when it was a question, but... Oh, gosh. Gotcha. Property values should be based on distances to Chick-fil-A's and Trader Joe's. Right. What I'm saying is... As with all topics in Dude's Brunch, it always devolves into, what would you have yours be? <laughs> well, I was just skipping the... I, I want to back the, up for a second to this whole, like, Tyler suddenly learns he lives on a hill and has to ride a bike up and down a hill thing. <laughs> Tyler, when was the last time you rode a bicycle? I was going to ask that too. It's been a whole minute. I like bet. 60 seconds. <laughs> I'm very intrigued about this whole Tyler relearns how to ride a bike thing. I'm beginning to think that if you listen to all of these podcasts in like a binge listen, it would just be the story of Tyler Reed rediscovering basic things about life. 
Tyler well, discovers fair, maps. I... Tyler discovers bicycles. For a while, I was just, I discovered walking. I, wa- I when I lived in the city with with Catherine for like three months, I was like, oh, I can just walk to places. <laughs> <laughs> If you made it through all of our last episode, I am so glad you came back because we are already off to a better start than we were last week, and we haven't even started the topics. It's time. We just that's right. We just need to make an animation of Tyler like beaking out of a shell like a little baby bird, just like peep peep, just like kind of knocking out of it, knocking little pieces of shells off, and like wakes up real quietly. Ha ah, ah. ha. Love it. Well, let's go ahead and get this show on the road. As always, we have topics from around the internet this week that we are going to discuss for you. And as always, you can play along at home on our bingo board, dudesbrunch.wordpress.com backslash bingo. Nobody has called bingo in a long, long time. Could happen this week. Maybe we need to change it. All right. So our first topic this week comes from Sean. Who wants to talk about tourism? Sean, what's the deal? So this week, not really tourism. I want to talk about fake tourism, tourist spoofs. So I tried to. How I was inspired by this was I was watching the uh, um, Futurama, and they did a, they do an Atlanta par- parody where they like go under the sea and the lost city of Atlanta and blah blah blah. So I came up with all these videos. I got one for Cincinnati. Don't talk shit about Norwood. I got the Cleveland tourism video. Uh, I have um, the Atlanta clip from Futurama, which is kind of, it's not so much the video as it is like the little clip. I highly recommend watching the whole episode to get like the whole story. Come on down to Cleveland town, everyone. Okay, so question number one is, knowing what you know about your city or former city, in my case, it was hard to find videos about D.C. I didn't find any. I don't know what's wrong with this city. It's called All of House of Cards. (laughs) <laughs> basically all of west wing um <laughs> is there any truth to these videos about your city oh the atlanta one's hilarious um it didn't talk about traffic as much as it probably should have but i love that the atlantan who is like a mermaid is like yeah we're a global city on par with new york and london and paris which is what everyone says about atlanta even though it's totally not true and then she's like, look at all of our landmarks. Turner Field, the Coca-Cola bottling plant, which is now the World of Coke Museum, and the airport. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, basically. I mean, you could add in there, like, Martin Luther King's birthplace, I think, would be the only other, like, huge item. But yeah, it was pretty on point. I was happy with it. I haven't really spent that much time in Norwood, but I guess generally in Cincinnati. So, let's see. Is but it? I think that video speaks a lot to the attitude of Cincinnati. Yes. Like, whatever neighborhood you're from, it's like, don't talk shit about Hyde Park. Right. <laughs> don't talk yeah, shit about Eastgate. About Eastgate. <laughs> if what you're saying is Cincinnati is a grouping of feral tribes fighting for dominance amongst one another in, in very old architectural buildings that were currently used as low-income housing for many people, <laughs> then yes, that is Cincinnati. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Uh, and to my to my recollection, everybody is pretty defensive about where they live. Like, well, if, if I see somebody from Cincinnati out at the store or something or somewhere, and they're like, "Oh yeah, I'm from Ohio," the last thing I want to do is say like, "Ah oh, yeah, your your part of town sucks," because they're gonna get all defensive. Like, yeah, I've met like three or four different Cincinnatians this weekend, and thankfully they've all been East Siders, and so I feel a real <laughs> affinity with them because they're like, "I'm from Milford, I'm from Loveland, I'm from Kings," and I'm like. Awesome. I'm really glad you didn't say Del High. <laughs> Take that, West Siders. <laughs> the worst. We like Skyline. Blah, blah, blah. To anybody in Cincinnati who listens to this podcast and you got that joke, thank you. <laughs> I, recently you think- dis- I recently discovered, I think there's a joke also in here somewhere, but I recently discovered there's apparently just several places that are like chili places like there's specifically like price hill chili there's um there's like not dixie washington chili, chili dixie chili, washington yeah. chili. Oh, <laughs> there's yeah. just like uh god there's there's more i can't I, I forget them but they just there's just chili places for every like little 
Oh, there's spiders. And those are the best chili places. Plus just for the record. Chili? Oh, they are. Like, Skyline and Gold Star are good, but if you want, like, true Cincinnati chili, you got to find one of these little places. That's where the, the real stuff is at. And similarly, here in Atlanta, it's barbecue places and taco places. Everybody yeah, has a so, favorite barbecue place and a favorite taco place, and it's usually the one closest to where they live. So as someone that clearly just moved to the region known as Pleasant Ridge, apparently it's where I live right now. When you type in Pleasant Ridge, the next thing that is, it's Chili, Pleasant Ridge Pool, and then a library, and then a brewery. So, I mean, Chili's the top of the charts, so... Mm. There you go. <laughs> Moving on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, mine was Cleveland because I couldn't find anything about Arlington or Washington, D.C. Unless you watch television, then you're pretty much there. Um, <laughs> but I want to say that it's... <laughs> Cleveland has this weird thing where it's like... I And don't get me wrong, I love Cleveland and I love Akron. Um, but when you watch the video, it kind of sums it up because everyone kind of hates... Everybody can see the blemishes, but everybody kind of loves it. And can kind of poke fun at it because of that. And I think that has a lot to do with Cleveland sports kind of just carrying over. But when they make the song joke about how, like, this train is taking jobs out of Cleveland, or, like, our greatest import is crippling depression, our export is crippling depression or something, like, yeah, pretty much. Like, <laughs> like if Emily was on here, I'm, I'm pretty sure that she would confirm everything like that. And it's funny because I remember when we were growing up in Cincinnati, the joke was that Cleveland was always the mistake on the lake, but Cleveland compares themselves to Detroit, which is they see as like the world's biggest mistake. Um, so at the end there, when they're, we're not Detroit, like that is pretty much what people in Cleveland think. Like, at least we're not Detroit. Um. <laughs> see, whereas everybody in Atlanta is like, oh yeah, we're totally a global city. Nah. So. But since someone's not here, what do you guys think of the New York one? Since we've all been in New York at some point or another. I thought it was hilarious. I loved the point towards the end of the video where he says, now I just need to get three more jobs so that I can stay in New York. I was like, yeah. That sounds about right based on everybody we've had on this show that lives in that city. <laughs> I appreciate the puppets, and it felt it was contextually relevant to our guest topic this week. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. I tried to look out. Nice. So, I don't know. I never lived in New York long enough to, I never even lived there. Never stayed in New York long enough to know if I need to have nine locks on my doors. We did but, go there one whole time. Yeah. I went there twice, but I can't say that I nice. would ever say that I'm like familiar with there. So, we drove through it last weekend. Hmm. Around it, through it, slash, Yay. Well, I think it's it's interesting, like, as somebody who studied the history of New York, that even, like, these parody videos are spot on with a lot of the, like, big critiques of the last 20 years in New York, where they talk about how everything is owned by mega corporations and whatnot. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this new show, The Get Down, on Netflix. I would not recommend it as a source of history, because it is all over the place. It's a Boz Boz Lerman. Lerman directed it. Yeah. That's why. You don't watch it for historical accuracy, but if you have no exposure to pre, like, corporate New York, it would be a great starter because you really see, like, how decrepit the city used to be. And so these parody videos always make me feel like there are just a few New Yorkers left who remember that time, and they're so pissed off that New York isn't a shithole anymore because they can't afford to live there. I'm like, I feel for them. I feel their struggle. So uh, which of these videos do you think is most accurate of your city? I want to say that I see my heart goes out to Cleveland because I know the video, but I want to say that Atlanta, even though I've only ever been to their airport. <laughs> well, and that's the thing is I think to anybody not from Atlanta, the Atlanta video is – the most accurate because everybody just thinks of the airport and Coke and right, maybe, and maybe the Olympics. Oh yeah, that's right. Whereas here in Atlanta, the Olympics is like one of the defining moments of this whole city. And like everything was built up for the Olympics, but everybody else is just kind of like, Oh yeah, the Olympics were there. 
<laughs> oh yeah, they have an airport, and they don't think about like it is literally the busiest airport on earth. That's it. That's all there is. Yeah, the former Olympics and the airport. <laughs> but there's a lot of other stuff to do. It's just Tyler, any, you know. any any feelings about um since you never left Cincinnati, and you can right, only stereotype as, cities. I don't know. I don't know if I can really comment on any of them. You're right. Although I could say, no. Have you ever flown on a plane? No. We've been over this. He's never been on a plane. Oh. Right. I was expressly forbidden from <laughs> flying on a plane because they're very dangerous. Someday I'm going to get you a cheap ticket to Atlanta and you're going to I'm not saying no. Well, Although that he's not it's going a... to fly. He just... right. So I want to kind of veer off for a second then and talk about a clip um, that... I saw over the week, and when I read Sean's topic, it just seemed perfectly in line. Are you guys familiar with this new show called Atlanta? I've seen advertisements for it everywhere today. So Atlanta is this new show from Donald Glover, a.k.a. Childish Gambino, who's from Atlanta, and it's about Atlanta, and it's all shot in Atlanta. It's like Atlantaception, and everybody down here is so unbelievably hyped about this show and my roommate and I watched the premiere last week and it's incredible like it's super well written in what ways oh never mind but there's this one scene in particular that I feel like is a perfect depiction of a very specific Atlanta thing and so I want to show it to you guys and see what you think of it there's a link in the slack For the record, no one's excited about watching TV shows about DC. People were super (laughs) stoked on The West Wing. People were stoked on Scandal. People were stoked on everything. It's just not not as fresh as Atlanta anymore, I guess. Was that God? We don't. We have no idea. (laughs) So this scene, I feel like that was that was a pretty beautiful scene, though. I'm not gonna lie. Right, and the whole show is like that. Oh, you should. It's great. I kind of. I mean, I am. You definitely should. It's amazing. But that scene is so perfect. Like, they're on a MARTA bus. There's nobody on the bus because fucking nobody rides MARTA. And it's the middle of the night, and some strange-ass dude comes over and offers Donald Glover a Nutella sandwich and then gets mad at him when he won't take a bite out of it and then just disappears into the woods. My roommate and I had to, like, pause the show and laugh, and we were like, that's exactly what it feels like to ride on MARTA. Like, every day. Even in broad daylight. That's what it's like. I love when, like, you can love a city and poke fun at it at the same time in that way. This would be a good This would be a good topic for, like, multi-episode stuff if there was ever a show about Cincinnati. Um, you mean besides not. WKRP? Yeah. But, I mean, there's, like, Hot in Cleveland, there's... And there's Atlanta shows, there's definitely DC shows and Baltimore shows, there's tons of New York shows but I don't know, that would be cool but uh, maybe some other time so my last question so we kind of stay on time is what city would you like to see a spoof tourism video made of and what would it involve I want to see a tourism video for Athens, Ohio (laughs) that is daytime and it's like Walk up and down Court Street and visit all the shops. Visit our miles of hiking trail. And then it cuts back and forth between day and night, where at night it's just, like, <laughs> fucking crazy student ragers, like, club music and just drunken masses. And then all of a sudden it's daytime, and it's like, come visit the Dairy Bar and Arts Center. Take a tour <laughs> of a historic what? asylum. I imagine it kind of flashing like Blair Witch Project or like um, American Horror Story where it's just like pop, 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 pop. and you see like the same sidewalk somebody's like throwing up or like peeing behind a dumpster or something exactly. there's like a nice family walking down like, <laughs> exactly mine would probably be Akron the background music would probably be White Wedding by Billy Idol and it would be <laughs> somebody in a cape with a suit made out of tires just like running around just kind of dancing in the street like modern dance style like just kind of jumping around um by everywhere that's like an abandoned factory floor where there's no more buildings or anything and the whole tourist thing would be like 
come and see the abandoned places because I know up there we have like the abandoned theme park and the abandoned shopping mall and Vice is all into that stuff now. So we'll definitely get some good uh, hipster, um, you know, Walking Dead tourists out of that one. And I, I, th- I think that Akron's pretty fixie friendly, pretty flat, slow hills, slow gradients. So yeah, come on down, everybody. We got some breweries too. It honestly surprises me that Walking Dead is filmed in Atlanta and not in Akron. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Eastgate. And then it's just a gif of just going through fast food location after fast food location, just (laughs) never ending the loop. We got the the Mickey D's next to the White Castle, next to the Skyline, next to the Arby's, next to the the Taco Bell, next to the the Burger King, next to the Subway, next to the... (laughs) The sushi place next to... <laughs> and don't forget the scenic Eastgate Mall with Spencer's and FYE and Spencer's. And shops that were probably pretty cool then inevitably closed three months later. Yeah, that sounds about right. Mm-hmm. And on that side note, I'm done. That was a great ending to a great topic, Sean. Way to go. Alright everybody, I've got our second topic this week, and I want to talk about Beck. Specifically, I want to talk about why Beck has the reputation that he does. Uh, A couple weeks ago, uh, a friend of the show, Nathan Hampton, tweeted that Sex bob the fictional band from Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, is grossly underrated as an actual band. And (laughs) I tweeted back at him and I was like, well, you know, that's basically just Beck. And he was like, what? And I sent in the Wikipedia article where it explains that Beck did all the music for that movie. And I realized that people are really, like, either passionate about Beck or passionately hate Beck. And he's, like, simultaneously overrated and underrated. And so I want to talk about that, starting with the obvious question of when was the last time that you guys listened to or generally cared about Beck? Um, always and probably recently. I was uh, I was pretty. I didn't like his acoustic album so much. The most recent one that won album of the year at the Grammys. Yeah, I did like Dreams though. As a single, I thought that was really good, and I like Wow. Wow is a good song. I'm not in love with those. It will probably catch on to me. I didn't like Dreams that as much first, but then once I got it stuck in my head, I was like, Ah, oh, you did it again. Tyler, thoughts on Beck? I really like Epro. Specifically as a song. <laughs> Arguably the least Beck Beck song. I never even well, that. You know, I think I like the idea of Beck more than I actually like listening to Beck. I think uh, he's definitely like a like a singles kind of guy for me, I think. That's definitely th- he feels like he's really good, really good in the playlist, I feel like. I feel like you, you throw Beck, Beck in a sort of like... He has like a lot of sort of like things he's kind of in between. He's kind of like an alternative kind of electronic. He's, you know, indie, you know, a little bit of rock. So he kind of like meshes really well, good transitions and stuff like that. There's this great, they have Futurama where um, Bender gets paralyzed and he does this folk revival kind of thing for a while. And Beck is like the character that he goes out with. And Beck is like, he's a head in a jar, but he's on a 99 cent store mannequin that he found in the dumpster. And like, he is like <laughs> he does this kooky adventure with Beck and one of the things he asks is like he like Beck tells him like, Well just use the arm and like make a scratch sound across the your chest and Bender's like, Won't that sound annoying? And Beck's like, I use those noises all the time in my music and every time I listen to Beck's music I'm like, Oh my god, it's just annoying sounds made into music. Ah oh. They figured it out and they make this joke where it's like what does Odile even mean? And Beck doesn't know. And there's like a rhyming Beckionary. Basically, it's just like the greatest thing ever because I love Futurama and I really like Beck. So I just love that. That's love that obviously my stuff. favorite episode of Futurama <laughs> is the Beck one. And it's actually Beck doing the voice, too. It is. It is. So <laughs> if, where's the where's the machine that slows or, sp- or speeds up the passage of time? Under the seat. <laughs> For me, is this one of those Led Zeppelins there? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just gone. <laughs> For me, um, I really didn't like the acoustic album, like Sean. I thought it was 
like every ballad from a Beck out al- from ten Beck albums strung together into one super ballad. And the album before that was Song Reader, the one that was only available as sheet music for the longest time. So really, the last Beck album that I actually cared about, I realized this week, was The Information. Which, which was, is a great album. Yeah, the super dancey electronic album that came after uh, Guero. And I remember those two albums back to back, where it was like Guero was the Rocky, like Epro, that sort of stuff, girl. And then he went into this crazy electronic world with information. Mm-hmm. That was super solid for me, and I loved Beck at that point. And then Modern I just. Modern Guild was good too. Oh, and Modern Guild. I forgot about Modern Guild. Oh my gosh, I love Modern That's Guild. What I mean. Gamma Ray is a super catchy song. Modern Guilt, produced by Danger Mouse, so you know it's good. Um, yeah, I I like kind of forget sometimes how much of Beck's discography I like because his recent output just hasn't impressed me, and so that's kind of how I felt with him. So we've talked a little bit about um, all the different stuff he does. Generally, you can assume that no Beck album will sound like the album before it, and so I was curious with you guys. What is your, like, quintessential Beck? Like, is there a song or an album that, like... If somebody asks, who is Beck, this is what you would send them? Well, I mean, aside from Loser, but... I mean, you can pick Loser. Loser is a good example. I mean, for a lot of people, it's Loser. I think I think E-Pro was, is on, like, our playlist at work. So I think it's just been, like, in the back of my mind. So it, it probably would would either be that one or actually i think i've heard wow a lot actually and from just from like alternative radio that we have on at work because we can't af- afford i guess to get another audio set up upstairs so we have to use public radio so <laughs> it's probably between those two i didn't realize wow was even a beck song i couldn't tell oh i could tell from the minute i heard it sean what's your quintessential beck ah uh-huh, man if i wanted somebody to listen to an album a beck that i thought was was really good Probably information. Done and done, whole album. If it was just one song, it would be Ramona. From the Scott Pilgrim soundtrack. Just the Scott Pilgrim soundtrack. I just, like, it just does it. Because if you want to get a little bit of folk back and you want to get a little bit of what Beck's voice sounds like, and you listen to rock, a rock one versus the acoustic one, you get a good sense of, like, how he kind of this is going to sound terrible because I just repeating all future on his lines here, but he's a folk musician that transcends genres and redefines them as he does them. It's very Beatles esque in the way that he does that, where he like takes a genre and makes it completely his own. Right. Which I think is why I kind of fell in love with his music. Uh, but for me, <laughs> this may seem like kind of an off the wall answer, but my quintessential, like if I just had one song to show it would be Sex Laws from Midnight Vultures. Are you guys familiar with this song? I don't remember it that well. Sex Laws is like super just kooky and weird. Um, We'll put a link in the show notes. It would either be that or Two Turntables and a Microphone off of Odele. Mm. Yep. Both of those I feel like just have like the sample heavy acoustic guitar out there surrealist lyrics that I associate with Beck at his prime. I don't think Beck ever left his prime. I don't think he's ever not... I mean, no, he's I think... probably had records that haven't sold as well as other ones. But I think that if I could like say there is an artist that has consistently been making like diversified music that has been good, even if I don't like it that much, even critically... Yeah, I would agree with that. I just think that in terms of... like, If you have to divide Beck songs into categories... His upbeat stuff is always my favorite and the most innovative stuff. And then his folky ballad stuff is a lot more standard, and I just mm-hmm. kind of ignore it. That why, that was why I didn't really care about Morning Phase, the most recent album. It just didn't really grip me because it was all, like, folk ballads. But a lot of people love that from Beck. I mean, Sea Change is one of his best-selling albums, so... So and I think, like, I just like that he does everything. And I've never heard Beck say, like... Smashing Pumpkins record skip that he's like trying to make something new and he doesn't like that his fans don't like the new stuff. I feel like he's never had to say that. He's no, never had to say like, I'm not making anything. Always like want to hear Beck. Like I'm going he to did see it right the first time. I'm going to a festival next weekend and Beck is playing uh, opposite one of the headliners, and I'm skipping the headliner to go see Beck 
because I just really want to see Beck. Like, I have no idea what he's going to play. He could play WoW and then nothing but the most recent album, and I would still love it. Do you think people just hate Beck? I get the vibe that there are people out there who don't like Beck for seemingly no reason. Or they think he's, like, overrated. It could be related to Scientology. That's true. But I think people just find him overrated or pretentious. Is is he a Scientologist? Yeah. He is a Scientologist, yes. He's very publicly a Scientologist. That's all right. I'm not going to judge him. I mean... I mean... A a younger me probably would... was was I think was a little turned off by that, but I think I'm just kind of like what? At, at some point, you have to kind of separate music from the, the person. person. Yeah, yeah. Brandon Flowers is a Mormon. Doesn't bother me at all. Doesn't make doesn't make me think of the killers any different. This is true. I actually kind of like that he has a little bit. Maybe that helps him write. Maybe that's what makes his music a little bit more interesting. Is he has a little bit different of a view. I think Beck has this like air of pretension around him though, that um. Some people just aren't a fan of. I, I think that that like that sense of high brownness is like false. I just don't see him as saying you know like I don't know. I don't know anybody that doesn't like Beck. I'm trying to come back against something that I'm thinking like why would you not like Beck? If you don't, that's fine. You probably say something like Eminem is the best rapper ever, though. So then, let's talk about the new song. Let's talk about Wow. Wow is one of these standalone singles from Beck. He's been doing this a lot recently, like the past few years, where he just puts out a really awesome single out of nowhere, and then it's never on an album. Like, Headphones came out a while back that was never on an album. Uh, This one, there was one last summer that I can't remember the name of. It's like he's trying to get the song of the summer every year by just putting out a really dope single, and then... It's great, but, like, they never gain traction. And so I was just wondering what you guys think of WoW as, like, a summer song generally, and also just what do you think of it specifically? I think it's good. I like the... I like hip-hop back, so it's not... Like, listening to this wasn't surprise me. Um, and I like that the imagery in the lyric video that I watched is very, like, Warholian, so that's very nice. Um, but I don't mind it doesn't put it out, and the album doesn't really bother me. Because I think this is, this seems like very Beck, and that you just like here it is. Like I feel like Beck would rather make one thing that's really good than make one thing that's really good and surround it with ten tracks that are crap. Yeah, I think I would love to have a full album that sounded like this song, but I agree that if he doesn't feel like he has an album's worth of material, I'm totally cool with just getting this one song in 2016 from Beck. Like, if this is the only song we get this year, that's totally fine. It's on my running playlist. I, like, get amped every time I hear it. I think it's a fantastic song. The chorus is great. The samples are hilarious. It's it's stuck in my head all the time. What are those samples you're specifically referring to? I guess they're not maybe samples, but they're the female vocals that are manipulated to sound like samples. Because it sounds like a familiar female voice that he uses in a lot of his songs, like some kind of backing vocalist. Sure. But he uses it in a way that it feels sampled. This definitely feels like Beck's interpretation of a, of like a song from now in his own style. Like a like a contemporary song. Like like this I don't know why, maybe because I'm um you know, I'm I'm not hip with the kids, but it's like um uh, it felt like sort of like the the instrumentals and like the stuff going on in the back, like the, the kind of the loop, the beat loop or whatever, felt a little like uh, uh, something from like the new like uh, Justin Bieber's like new song, like one of his newer songs, felt like it was very sort of had that same kind of like like style. Yeah, it has that um, kind of like tropical house with a hip hop beat thing going on. There you go. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's been the sound of 2016 for sure. Right. So it feels like that's a, his interpretation of sort of like that that thing that we're coming into right now, now. which I think is fine. I uh, I mean I'm into it. Like I said, I didn't realize it was Beck because it doesn't feel like he's using a lot of the same tools he typically uses. Like it's not very like guitar heavy. It doesn't have that like that sort of like very like rough and dirty guitar he usually has. It's usually like a, the focal point of a lot of his uh, his big hits. I think 
But maybe that's just some of the songs that I like in particular. Maybe it's not so much that people dislike back then. Maybe it's just people aren't paying attention. Does that, I mean, does that feel more accurate? That people, it's not that they actively dislike Beck. It's just that they're not really paying attention to him right now. Like, it seemed like an upset when he won Album of the Year at the Grammys. Yeah. Which, granted, (laughs) I, I think Kendrick probably should have won it. But it was like he came out of nowhere and like hardly anybody had even listened to that album. I don't know if people aren't paying attention to him as much as it's like, clearly people in the music industry, if he won that, are paying attention to him. Because I want to say like, oh, the people chose who won. But clearly they didn't. Because I, I think you're right. I think that, you know, there's more of an, it takes more of a off the beaten path kind of approach to find Beck nowadays versus when Beck was like in super popular music and he was you know during the 90s when pop when like alternative music was rock music versus being like almost pop today that's not that's not a comment on like the state of pop music being terrible or something or alternative today or whatever right it was just it was on trend at the time right that's a good way to put it beck was on trend and now i think that his trend is niche and so within our niche of like the alt rock culture Everybody respects Beck as this kind of elder statesman, right? But and but I feel like when he won that best album, it was like when you watch the Grammys, right? Because it's an it's the kind of the Academy, or not the not the Grammys, um, the Oscars, because it's the Academy picking who it is, you know, like who are these people listening to? Um, yeah, and it definitely uh, are had the that are the Grammys rigged? Maybe. <laughs> Oh, I mean, they are. They're picked by an academy. They're not picked by popular vote. Right. So it's just like, yeah, clearly people are listening to him. I think that's why I don't have a problem with him making, like, one really good song. It's not a big deal. People are going to listen to it. People want to hear that he can do it. People want to hear what he has to do. I mean, he might not be on, like, the cusp of it, but I might argue that he never was on the cusp of it. Because if he was, I don't think he would have ever gotten off the ground. Yeah, there's this certain, like, strange timelessness to the way he makes music that being trend... Like, if Beck was trying to be trendy, it would almost defeat the purpose of what he's doing. and our third topic this week comes from Tyler. Tyler, what do you have for us this week? Insert the Sonic 3 intro music here. Alright, so this week uh, I wanted to talk about Sonic Mania. No, everybody. Not what you're thinking. Not the hysteria over Sonic the Hedgehog that everyone loves. Our favorite blue blue blur. <laughs> no, we're talking about the brand new game that's going to be released here Eventually. soon. <laughs> Eventually. And so I want to... Next this, installment this of Sean Doesn't Play? That's right. This really could be divided up into at least three different topics, but I kind of wanted to just do a cursory overview of just sort of the current state of Sonic. So first, I want to know, what is your history of Sonic, and do you have any love for the franchise or the characters? Contrary to popular belief, I did actually care about video games in my life at one point, and Sonic was one of the franchises that I actually loved the most. I played Sonic 1, 2, 3, and Knuckles. Um, I didn't play Sonic 4 because it was apparently shit. So I graduated straight from Sonic 3 and Knuckles to Sonic Heroes for the GameCube, which was the first game I ever bought for the GameCube. Yeah, I'm just, like, I have a lot of nostalgia for the Sonic franchise. I think those games are, like, really simple and a lot of fun. Favorite character, real quick? Uh, Tails. Good choice. He's the one that flies. Yeah, and Sonic's just a little too fast for me. I don't have the reflexes to play as Sonic. I watch people play Sonic on Sega, so I'm familiar with watching it, but I didn't really play that often. My favorite character is Knuckles, though. With a name like Knuckles, you have to be cool. Right. He's got big fists. 
to punch you with. He can do all this other Sonic can, can he? Yeah, he, he's... Oh, no, no. Now, now if, if fans remember, Knuckles can't jump quite as high, but it's typically... Uh, means that he has to go alternate routes, and that means he has to go through different adventures and has different obstacles to, to overcome. <laughs> Which I want to speak to for just a second. He can punch mm-hmm. the hell out of whatever he wants. He sure can. One of my favorite things about Sonic games is that you could play through them multiple times as different characters and do a different thing every time you played it. Mm-hmm. And that was why I really enjoyed them. I think that's a similar reason of why I enjoyed games like Dead Rising, where it has multiple endings. Because I like the idea of knowing the game, but also having like this unknown factor to it. I think that was a great idea on the part of the designers of Sonic. Sure, and it has not a whole lot to do with about, with about going fast, but it's about knowing your surroundings and able to over you know to to effortlessly move through them. But Tyler, you gotta go fast. Got- Gotta go fast. Speaking of that, was always the thing. Uh, everybody always wanted to go s- see how fast they can make it through a level. It was never to get a high score. It was just to get to the boss as quick as you can. Well, yeah, because that was the good part. <laughs> oh, yeah, I would so, argue with that. I think the bosses are the worst part. But anyway. Oh well, right. Um, did anybody watch the cartoons? Any of the car- no. any of the various cartoons? No. No. I remember that it was on, but I don't think I ever watched it. Gotcha. Okay, then we'll just skip over that. Then. <laughs> Most of them, okay. <laughs> Maybe not good. <laughs> so, um, so it sounds like we're about half familiar. Uh, I guess I didn't give my input. I am very familiar with Retro Sonic. That was my first game. Number one game that I played was... Sonic 2, 3, and then went back to 1. And then I almost immediately fell off the Sonic train as soon as it went to 3D. But I did appreciate them at the time. I don't know if I do anymore. Um, but yeah, and what, what is my favorite character? Ooh, see, here's the thing. Here's the thing about Sonic characters. When you're young, you like Knuckles. Because he can punch, and he goes through walls... And he can like climb up the climb up the stuff, or he like tails because he can fly and he can just go wherever he wants. But you're like, but Sonic is the best because he's got the shields, he's got the power shields that give him the electricity and the, and the volcano stuff. But he has that spinny dash air in the move that sucks balls. <laughs> yeah, see, and that's enough to draw me away from him. The Wait, shields so are you cool, just, but so you just like shat on all the other characters, and then you said, well, I like Sonic, but he's also crap. Well, they're all well, fatally okay. flawed. That's, like, part of the point. Right. Well, so so the, I think like, I feel like the thing about Knuckles is that he's, like, that, that like, that uh, anti-hero character that everyone, like, is like, oh, that's me. He's so cool. He's got, he's got, he can do everything. He's, like, the Green Ranger. Knuckles is, like, the Green Ranger. Well, and I think Knuckles is interesting because you would always play as Knuckles after you played through as Sonic or Tails. Because you had to do all those alternate routes and relearn the levels. Mm-hmm. You had to put the expansion pack. That being said, Knuckles is still a really fucking cool character. So I realize I sound like I was shitty on on Sean. No, no, they're all but good I, characters. I don't want. That's I, I didn't mean to like hate on anybody. Because Sonic is a great character, and I like that you're right. Taylor's right, and you're right when saying when you can play through multiple levels of different characters, that adds some great dimensions to your game especially in this in w- with the 2d platform where you're kind of like let, let's be realistic your avenues for creativity you know are, are are kind of limited you know imagine if you could play super meat boy with another character that had different things it'd probably be just as uh painfully hard and will breaking as uh, it was to play the first time with just regular meat boy that's right you can and do there there's that actually a lot of lock rules that's fine because you it's fine you did not like that game so it's fine <laughs> But uh, but no, wow. I just I distinctly remember the level where I was like, ooh, this is this is t- testing the limits of this game was in Chemical Plant Zone when you could put in Sonic and Knuckles, you could play as Knuckles because there was like a particular like tower you could climb up and it would get you like three one ups like in a row that you just glided from like the next one to the next one and you're like, oh, I'm at the final level or I'm at the I'm at the pole. <laughs> yeah, Chemical but, Plant Zone was always like. That and Casino Zone were my two favorites. Casino Zone is cool. Casino Zone's mm-hmm. the shit. Although I do like Green Zone. Just the standard. That was just classic. Green. The, yeah, the classic. Yeah. The, just... the, the Mario 1-1 kind of of Sonic is, it's the, 
slightly tropical green generic area. Yeah, I like that one too. That's one of my favorites. Um, but yeah, so with that being said, so where does Sonic Mania fit into this sort of this this gaming niche? Like, does it have a niche? Does it is it filling a particular uh, role here? Um, I, I realize I'm talking to two people that probably don't play a lot of video games. So. Is, is there is there a nostalgia niche out there? Or is that just something that's made up? Oh, there is. It's nostalgia niche city right now with the new NES coming out and. You know, a bunch of classic Nintendo games getting released on the Wii U, and Mario's coming to iOS. Like, it is nostalgia city right now in casual gaming, and I am on board. Absolutely love it. So, what that being, so I think really kind of where I wanted to go with that almost was where I do want to talk about sort of the pixel aspect. So, as two people that are relatively non gamers, do you like games that have pixel graphics? You know, Pixel graphics don't really, like, differentiate for me whether or not I'm going to like a game. It's just typically games with pixel graphics are simpler in their mechanics. And I think what I've realized is Mm -hmm. I don't want a game that's super complex in terms of, like, basic gameplay mechanics. You know, so something like, Mm -hmm. for example, Counter-Strike, which a bunch of my friends absolutely love, I can't, Mm -hmm. like, play for more than an hour because I don't want to sit there and think about okay, well, I have to jump when I get to this doorway so that the sniper can't hit me as I'm passing through and, like, all of that complicated shit. Like, I just want... Or I need to buy this gun in this round so that I have enough money to buy that gun in that round. I'm like, no. I just want to fight my way through the level, get to the end, and move on. Like, I think no frills is in some way the best test of, like, how good a game is. How compelling can you make it without a bunch For sure. of frilly stuff? I definitely agree. So what you're saying is, you, you, do, you said that like graphics aren't necessarily a, a major factor of your enjoyment of a game but the mechanical the mechanics of it really yeah because uh a great example of this is monument valley sean and i both loved monument valley and it's beautiful but it plays like a classic game because it's just really simple i don't i don't play video games enough to need options as uh super viewers would know um that's why I really don't mind. Like, when I saw the new Sonic, I was like, oh, if Tyler bought me this, I'd probably play it. Because I feel like I don't need to have a bunch of options. Like, I just want to play a game. That's why I kind of enjoyed Super Meat Boy, is because you kind of just can play through it. Same way with, with Fez. I like that, too. There wasn't, you know, there's not a whole menu where it's like, you're right, Taylor. Do I need to get this? Blah, blah, blah. Like, with Bastion, I felt like that. But um, mm-hmm. I liked the whole playthrough thing. Just, like, use your character. You don't have to think about much. Just get to the level. Kind of enjoy it for what it is. That was exciting. So, pretty... So, okay. So, I guess maybe the more pointed question is what I'm looking for is, um, did you notice, like, I'm assuming you watched some gameplay of it, of Sonic Mania? Did you watch the Studio studio Zone specifically? I did, yeah. yeah. So, did you happen to pick up sort of, like, like, kind of, like, there was a lot of, like, a lot of, like, graphic things going on. There's, like, lots of, like... So many like animations. There's it was very. It felt very alive and very active. Like, did you pick up on that at all? Did you notice, or was that just sort of like? Did you kind of? Oh go yeah. Into it? I mean, that's kind of why I like it. I think the reason that I liked Casino Zone back in the day is partially that it's challenging. Like, there's so much shit on the screen that having the situational awareness like we were saying earlier to know where you need to go next and what the obstacles are in that like mess of visual information <laughs> that's a really cool challenge for me john did you notice anything about it how do i say this it's not really as much of a critique as much as if i would have made it different if i was going to do like a throwback to a 2d model mm-hmm. that the 60 frames per second almost and with the way that it's pixelated with the 8-bit look it makes it look mm. really weird, like kind of confusing, because there's it's so fast and it's pixelated at the same time. Like it kind of reminds me of the first time that you went over to someone's house, or maybe you had like a super nice television, and the sound was just a little bit behind the picture, just because the clarity was so much better than what you used to seeing, and how strange that looked. Yeah, it was like when everybody got HD TVs for the first time. Exactly, exactly. That's kind of I remember that how I felt. I I I remember when I watched Zombieland for like the first time in like like HD. That was like the first movie I saw. I was like, this I don't I don't like how this looks. It's too 
everything's so separated. <laughs> right. It's like it's like too real. Mm-hmm. Like it's not doesn't seem like the television you're used to looking at. That was my only criticism, but it's I don't know it's not so much a critique because the more I watched it, the more it kind of went away. But I was just reflecting on the sign that I used to know when they were talking about the glitches and stuff. I kind of I don't know. Maybe so much I didn't really notice the glitches then as much as I think like having the glitches in there is okay. Sean, I, did you I, I kind of up... like great games that have glitches built into them. Sean, did you grow up uh, playing Sonic on a Genesis? Yes. I think that's the difference then, because I grew up playing Sonic games ported to the PC. And so I was used oh. to playing them at a higher frame rate, because I was too young to know the Genesis. And so this just looks like a slightly crisper version of the Sonic that I grew up with. Mm-hmm. So I guess sort of like so that's interesting that you think that it's almost too good. Like Sean's like, I think the there's too many frames. Which is interesting because like I distinctly remember when I first saw like the trailer for like for, for the for the like the demo of this and I, I saw like the opening like cinematic where he like Sonic like open like he comes out and he's like spins around and then he like <laughs> does like all those like cool hand motions. Which is like Oh my god, that's the sexiest fucking thing I've seen all day. Because it was just so like fluid. Because I don't know, maybe it's because I just have an appreciation for like pixel graphics. I'm like, that took so much like, like, to to make that all happen. And I, I think I saw like, like a frame, like like a side by side of like the Sonic Four like like intro sequence and like then this one. And it's like there's like ten frames of Sonic Four. It was like boop boop. <laughs> yeah, like, they they did that comparison in one of the videos you link, and it is incredible to see like ten frame intro with stick motion graphics to a mm-hmm. fully fluid sixty frames per second animation. Like it, it didn't bother me so much. Like one place that you can really tell is when he does the hop and he kind of does the spin in it, mm-hmm. and you can kind of see like how clear it looks in that moment versus the pixelated one when it kind of turns into this like blue blur. When he kind of spins, mm-hmm. um, or when they were showing in the in kind of the what was it, Game Grumps, when they had him go to the edge, mm-hmm. and they were seeing if he would do like the foot tap, or if he would do the foot tap when you're like he's like waiting for you to move, like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yes, I think that you did notice it, and it's a lot clearer. But that said, having watched the intro one more time, there are points, especially during the boss level, where Sonic seems overwhelmingly clear, versus mm-hmm. when he's in this when he's in the profile view mm-hmm. and it seems flat again. That's what's weird. There seems to be these moments where it's not 2D anymore. Oh, like the shading makes it look a little oh. too three-dimensional? Yes, exactly. Maybe that's just with Green Hills Zone because it feels like that one's particularly flat. It feels like it fits in a lot better in like the studio zone because it has a lot more like depth to it, I think, maybe. And that, I mean, that's that's what I mean. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm not throwing this game out or saying it's a bad game. Maybe no. I'm noticing there's not a, a continuity there. And that, like, having played the original on Sega Genesis, that's kind of what I was looking for. Like, mm-hmm. the real one. And I know that people are like, why? Because I, I, I could see myself saying, like, why would you want that? You want a new game with all the things fixed. And yeah, I, I can see that, but... I don't know. I just that's something just I've noticed. Well, I think it's mm-hmm. similar to this new, um, oh, what's it called? Super Mario Maker. Is that what it's called, Tyler? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where the game is that you build two D platformer levels for Mario, but the whole thing is three D animated, mm. and it suffers from a very similar discontinuity where like all the characters are three dimensional and they have shadows and they have shading and all this stuff, but they only move left and right. And as somebody who grew, grew up on, you know, Super Mario for the SNES, like, that's how I experience Mario and how I remember Mario to this day. And so now with Super Mario Run coming out for the iPhone uh, later this year and it's going to be in full Retina HD, <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready for that. Like, it feels very strange. He's going to be really crisp, but still two-dimensional. Right. He can only run right, but he's going to look but, good while he's doing it. 
but he's fully 3D rendered. Don't you worry. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. Uh, what kind of kind of what Sean was getting at? That there's a, there's some jarringness to like it looking so good. I get you. Um, so I guess just to kind of round things off. So when they announced Sonic Mania, they had this live stream that was just this awkward, poorly timed, like poorly managed, like an anniversary special, and there was just like. They had like Crush Forty, the band that did a lot of their their songs for a lot of their for their newer games, and they had this live performance, and it was like great for the most part. And it's like <laughs> this is the sound of twenty five years of Sonic. <laughs> no sound from the crowd, <laughs> and you're like, oh, so that kind of pair, pairing that kind of with like. Sonic's general social media presence, which has been very strange to say the least. It's, it's definitely one of the most absurd social media accounts I, I think we have available right now. And so I just kind of wondered, will they, are, are they, do they know? Are they just trying their best? Are they embracing the memes? Oh, they're totally embracing the memes. Sonic the Hedgehog is the only corporate account I have ever seen knowingly acknowledge the Harambe meme. <laughs> like, people have made jokes vaguely on the fringe of Harambe, but no brand is like, yeah, man, we're just going all in on this fucking Harambe shit. Like, R.I.P. dicks out for Harambe. But that's basically where <laughs> Sonic went with this. And I'm like, are you for real right now? Like, you're part of a multinational corporation. You probably shouldn't be making Harambe jokes. <laughs> or should you? Or should you? And then, and then, and then it's just stuff that's like it's Sonic like riding a hedgehog with like chili dogs and like rings, and then it says <laughs> haters will say it's fake, and you're just like, well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> or the ones that are like inspirational quotes overlaid over Sonic characters. <laughs> like, why? Why does this need to be a thing? This looks like something that came right out of 4chan. I mean, and, and, and sometimes it feels like they're... I, don't, I just don't know. I mean, <laughs> I just don't know what to say. I will bet you a beer that by the end of the month, the Sonic the Hedgehog account tweets some sort of doggo or pupper-related meme with one of the characters. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Look at look at that fa- I, look at that fast I'm little just, just... hedger. And now it's time to round the show out like we always do with a round of shameless plugs from the panel, starting of course with Tyler. Gotta go fast. Reed, what you got for us, Tyler? Hi, everybody. You can find my design and illustration at tylerdread.com, and you can follow me on socials as TDR Design on Instagram and Twitter. You should also follow uh, my company's account, the Rook OTR. Talk to me about board games, please. Sean, it's like right now, Evans. <laughs> what would you like the people to do this week? Uh, if you want to check me out on Twitter, it's at SEvans8910. Sevens eight nine ten. Um, been on the Spotify's lately, so probably gonna get on Facebook. Post some awesome uh, new music that I've been discovering uh, for me and for you. Merry Christmas in September as we move on to the world's greatest month, which is October. Don't don't spill the beans on that, but it is October. Um, yeah. Other than that, <laughs> see you guys next week. And shameless plugs for me. You can follow me on Twitter at TC Olmstead. You can follow the show and like the show on Facebook. We are at Dudes Brunch on both. And I am still working on Forced Fandom Season 2, where Emily Bamforth and I are watching tons of Gilmore Girls. They talk way faster on that show than seems humanly possible. If you want to hear me talk about that, you can find us on iTunes. Just search Forced Fandom. Other than that, thanks so much, everybody, and we'll see you next week for more brunch. Ha, 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 ha.
This week's mu minute. Yeah. This week's moment of musical cr- cringe brought to you by Black Coffee. Black Coffee, the same color as Sean's soul. <laughs> that, I think that was the Mario song. I don't think that was even the Sonic song. <laughs> it sure was, Sean. It was like the Sonic Two song, or not oh, the, Sonic 2, the, the Mario Two song.